Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Robin Archer. I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband program here at the LSC, and I couldn't be more pleased than to introduce our speaker tonight, Paul Novak. Paul, as many of you will know, is the General Secretary of the TUC. I think it probably seems longer to you, but in fact he's only in his first year in that <laughs> job, but there's been quite a lot going on. Um, but Paul's been a trade unionist all his working life. He first joined a union when working in a supermarket on a part-time basis at the age of 17, and since then he's worked a, in a bus company, as a hotel porter, at a BT call centre, and in various other jobs. Um, and in fact, in one of his agency jobs, he was sacked for trying to organise a trade union. Well, later he was part of the first group of uh, graduates, I guess you would call them, from the TUC's organising academy. And he went on to work for different individual unions and also regional organisations. And then, in the last decade, he's been in a senior leadership role at the Trades Union Congress itself. And there he played an instrumental role in some of the great issues of the last decade. Things like defending the pension system for public sector workers, right through to the um, securing the furlough scheme or working with others to secure the furlough scheme, uh, which was so, so important for so many people during the recent pandemic. Well, the trade union movement has been a mighty force in shaping Britain. And I think you can feel the potential of that force again today. You can feel it in the surge of industrial action as people try to defend their position. And you can see it too in the strengthening position of the party, the party which the TUC convened and brought together about a century and a quarter ago. A party which, by the way, a number of the people who helped found the LSE also played an instrumental role in helping to organise the British Labour Party. Britain's in a plastic state and organised labour is helping to reshape it. So there could hardly be a better time, I think, than to hear now from the General Secretary of the TUC. Paul's going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, then I'll ask him a couple of questions, chair-led discussion it's called, and then we'll turn it over to you. Plenty of time for questions and discussion. But before we do that, can I ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, Paul Novak. Uh, well, thanks Robin for that uh, introduction. It is a huge honour to be here at the LSE, in particular to be asked to give a lecture in the Ralph Miliband series. I'll say a little bit more about Ralph Miliband during the course of my remarks. I should start maybe by giving you all a little bit of a caveat. Um, a lecture room in the LSC is not my natural environment. It's not the natural environment of many trade unionists. If you put me on a picket line, and I was on a picket line this morning with clinical support workers uh, on the Wirral in Merseyside or in front of a demonstration or a rally with tens of thousands of people, a union conference, I'm absolutely fine. Uh, you put me in a lecture theatre, put me uh, behind a lectern and ask me to spend 40 to 45 minutes dispensing pearls of wisdom. Uh, I'm not quite so comfortable, particularly when we have such a distinguished audience of academic students and experts. So please don't be expecting theoretical insights or complex academic uh, frameworks. Instead, what I want to do is root my remarks today in the experiences of our 5 million uh, members up and down the country. Everybody from supermarket workers to care home assistants to aviation engineers to bus drivers, every conceivable occupation and profession, the TUC will have a union that organises those workers. And my starting point for this lecture, in fact, the starting point for all of the work that I do every single day is what more can we do to best represent and win for those working people, their families uh, and communities. I want to plant this thought in your head, though, before I get into the substance of my remarks. We're told every single day when you pick up a newspaper, turn on the television or the radio or go online, that we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis. And that is the case for many of the people that I represent, that our unions represent. I've met them this year uh, since I've been General Secretary of the TUC. Paramedics who literally can't afford to put petrol in their car 
to drive into work to do their shift. Hospital cleaners who are reliant on the weekly food bank that goes into their workplace to make ends meet. Shop workers who are literally skipping meals themselves so that they can put food on the table for their children. So lots of our members are living through a cost of life living crisis, but frankly, not everybody uh, is. And I can talk you through some of the statistics on that later on, but just consider this set of points. Last year, Porsche motor cars had its best ever year for sales in the UK. Best ever year for sales in the UK market last year. This weekend, anybody who read The Guardian, you'll have seen the article on the rise of super luxury hotels in London. Rooms starting at £1,000 a night, going up to £10,000 a night, £20,000 a night. Demand for those rooms at an all-time high. And last year, FTSE 100 bosses, the people who employ our members, many of whom are struggling to make ends meet, saw their pay rise, on average, by half a million pounds last year alone. The UK economy is failing on a whole range of indicators, whether it's GDP growth, on productivity, on investment in skills, on living standards, and yet we have an economy that has become incredibly effective at rewarding wealth and not work. And in my view, that's unfair, it's unsustainable, and it's unjust. And I want to talk about how we change it, and that'll be the substance of what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, Robin. Let me start, though, by saying a little bit about the state of our current politics and of the trade union movement itself. And I want to start uh, with a quote. It's quite a long quote. Uh, there are countries where the looming defeat of a government gives rise to complex judgments concerning the identity of its successor. Britain is not one of them. The decline of the present Conservative government, which has recently assumed spectacular proportions, and its ever more likely defeat at the approaching general election, can have only one beneficiary, the Labour Party. Of course, nothing is, in this, is certain in this context till it's come about, and it would be incautious to underestimate the Conservatives' capacity to overcome their disadvantage with energy and effect. But it is doubtful they can now regain enough impetus to take them to victory in the year between now and the date when they must call an election. If the electoral cons consultation were held today, they would be massacred. If next spring, the prediction has it, they will be soundly beaten and Labour, after more than 12 years in opposition, would find itself in government again with a substantial parliamentary majority. Not the words of a recent political commentator, but the words of Ralph Miliband in 1963, ahead of an election that, a year later, Labour did win, albeit with the smallest of parliamentary majorities. And with an election likely within the next 12 months, I think we are on the cusp of political change again. Now, like Ralph Miliband, I don't take anything for granted. I joined the Labour Party just weeks before the 1992 general election and watch Labour snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, so I am never complacent about the outcome of a general election. But as Thursday's historic by-election showed, the mood of the country, I think, has shifted decisively away from the Tories. A party that is consumed by internecine warfare, that's ripped up its pledges on net zero, that's abandoned plans we were just talking about it before, Robin, to deliver high-speed rail to the north of England, perhaps not a surprise when we have a Prime Minister who spends more time in private jets and in helicopters than he does on trains, that's made a mockery of its so-called levelling up agenda that helped it win a sway the red wall seats in 2019, and frankly, a party that is more interested in dividing working people than supporting working people, perhaps exemplified by its dog whistle approach to migration and asylum seekers. A, a young Ralph Miliband, I think it's worth making the point, seeking asylum in Britain today. Indeed, a young Joe Novak, because my grandfather also came to Britain during the Second World War, may not have been able to settle here, let alone raise a family or make such an incredible contribution to this country. Now, most political commentators, perhaps more importantly, most bookmakers, are convinced all this and more means that the Conservatives face wipeout at the next election. And frankly, for unions and their members, that can't come soon enough. 2023, this year, has been a huge year for the TUC, for our 48 unions and those 5 million members. Inflation may be easing, interest rates may have plateaued, but that cost of living crisis, that's a lived reality for many of the people that we represent, continues to hammer working people. Over the past year, the cost of the weekly shop has gone up, rents have gone up, mortgages have gone up, fuel and energy bills have gone up, everything has gone up apart from wages. And the reason why this cost of living crisis is so painful 
For so many, it's because it's also a long-term pay crisis. British workers are in the midst of the longest squeeze on pay in over two centuries. In real terms, our pay is 2.9% lower than it was. Not 2.9% lower than it was last year, or the year before, or even a decade ago. 2.9% lower in real terms than it was at the beginning of 2008, almost 16 years ago. Proof positive, I believe, that we have a dysfunctional, lopsided, failing economy. So it is no surprise that workers are angry. It is no surprise that they're fed up with lectures about the need for pay restraints, and no surprise that we've seen a major upsurge in industrial action, as you referred to it uh, before, uh, Robert. Now, I've been General Secretary for 10 months. Uh, I've been proud during that 10 months to stand on dozens of picket lines alongside thousands of workers. Paramedics, civil servants, teachers, railway workers, dockers, bakery workers, and many more, often taking strike action for the first time in their working uh, lives, and all taking industrial action for fair pay because they can't afford another year of a real terms pay cut. Now, taking strike action is hard. People lose pay. It's not an end in itself. It's not a political act or gesture. It's a means to an end. And that end is bringing employers to the table when all else fails. And that's why it's important that not only have our unions been taking action for workers all across the economy, they've actually been winning for workers as a result of that action. If you listen to Conservative ministers, strikes don't work. But they've worked for hundreds of thousands of workers over the course of the last 12 months. They've worked for Jacobs workers. I went down to see those workers on the picket line, offered 2.5% by their employer, an employer with a parent company last year that made profits of £1.44 billion, offered 2.5%. They won a 6.5% pay rise as a result of industrial action. Uh, Kingsmill Bakers won 9% uh, pay rise. Liverpool Dockers, 18% uh, pay rise. And this time last year, in the public sector, ministers were telling us it's the outcomes of the pay review bodies, that's it, there is no more money, there will be no further negotiations. And they were wrong again, because by taking action in the NHS, in, the ed in education and in the civil service, our members won much better deals. It's precisely because they did win better deals that the government is so intent now on attacking our right to strike. And frankly, and I'm happy to talk about this in the discussion, it is incredible that a government that can't keep our rivers clean, that can't run railways, that can't run our NHS, can find time in its legislative programme to attack the right to strike. And its Strike Act, the strike act which has just gone onto the statute book, will impose so-called minimum service levels in key sectors. Uh, actually, what it will really do is effectively take away the right to strike from one in five uh, workers. It will also prolong disputes unnecessarily. It will poison industrial relations, and it will make the UK an international outlier. In my view, that Strike Act is the last gasp of an administration in its death throes. And there is a growing sense that we live in a broken Britain, a country where nothing works, where it's impossible to get a GP appointment if you don't ring up on Monday morning at 8 o'clock and somehow manage to get through the automated system, where schools are literally built from concrete that has fallen around our kids' and teachers' heads and nobody does anything about it and where there are legions of people sleeping rough on our streets and millions of workers who are dependent on food banks. It is the inevitable consequence of a labour market where one in five workers doesn't earn enough to live on, where one in nine is trapped in some form of insecure or precarious work, unsure where the next paycheck is going to come from, where it will come from, how much it will be worth. And that is the context, all of that is the context, in which the next election will be fought and hopefully, from my perspective, won by Labour. An election won by Labour, I'll be frank though, a Labour government might be essential to starting to fix Britain, but a Labour government will also have its work cut out to tackle the wreckage it will inherit from the Conservatives, let alone deliver the reforms and the investment this country is crying out for. So as in 1945, as in 1964, as in 1997, we will need a bold, radical Labour government with a clear vision for how it wants to transform uh, Britain. Now, for all the criticism of the current Labour leadership, for perhaps all of their maybe justified caution, I think that we've got the makings, the beginnings of a decent manifesto. Labour is pledged to bring our railways back where they belong, in public ownership, 
to deliver a massive wave of public sector insourcing that could save the British taxpayer billions of pounds, to create a new publicly owned energy firm, Great British Energy, run in our interests and not the interests of shareholders, to invest in new jobs, skills and technology through its Green Prosperity Plan, which is led by Ed Miliband, Ralph's son, to build in new homes, including council homes that people desperately need, and perhaps most importantly, for the TUC and the people we represent in workplaces to deliver a new deal for workers, the biggest expansion of workers' rights and trade union rights in a generation, a ban on zero hours contracts, a ban on fire and rehire, so we never again have a scandal like P&O where 800 workers were sacked without notice or consultation, giving unions the right to access workplaces physically and digitally, repealing the anti-trade union legislation, including that Strike Act, and introducing new fair pay agreements which will raise wages and standards and, uh, and conditions across whole sectors, starting with social care. A new deal that Labour is committed to deliver, an employment bill to take forward in the first 100 days of a Labour government, through in one piece, onto the statute book and into the workplaces. Rebalancing our labour market, yes, empowering unions to win for workers, but also, crucially, tackling head-on low pay and that insecurity that blights the lives of millions of working people. Now, all of that, I think, starts us on the right path, but we shouldn't beat around the bush. We face some massive long-term challenges, whoever wins the next election. The ongoing impact of Brexit on jobs, on growth, on trade, on national prosperity, the explosion of artificial intelligence and other technologies which are already transforming the world of work. Demographic change, which is placing huge demands on health and social care. And of course, the climate emergency and the imperative of delivering a just transition to net zero. All of those challenges demand more, not less government. More, not less investment in skills, services and infrastructure more, not less, of a role for unions and collective bargaining. And in countries like Spain, Australia, which you will know, Robin, the United States, uh, they're already seeing the start of that levelling of the playing field for Labour, and I want this country to follow suit. So given the scale of the challenge, maybe I would just stress action in three areas, and this uh, uh, will sort of set out really what I think are the TUC's priorities as we move into that next general election. First priority, is securing a consensus for the TUC's view that we do need to build an economy that rewards work and not wealth. In the post-war period, policymakers, politicians, actually politicians from across the political spectrum, grasped the need for root and branch reform, for an economy that was managed not just in the interest of big business, finance capital and the rich, but of working people, the real wealth creators. And they delivered genuine progress in that post-war period. Wages, were, wages and conditions improved. We got more employment rights. We saw our share of national wealth grow. The historian Eric Hobsbawm called it the forward march of labour. And it was the result of deliberate policy choices, progressive legislation, new regulations, and a conscious decision, crucially, to empower unions. Strong trade unions, more collective bargaining coverage, delivered huge gains for working people, among them unprecedented levels of income inequality. Ideological change from the mid 70s onwards put an abrupt stop to all of that. The new rights counter revolution was driven by a very different set of policy choices. Whether it was Margaret Thatcher in Downing Street or Reagan in the White House, the power of the state was used for very different ends. Regulations were axed, taxes for the rich slashed, traditional industries were left to die, and crucially, unions came under sustained attack. And whether it was air traffic controllers in the US or miners and print workers here, the power of the state was used to crush striking workers and their unions. And as a result, the number of trade union members, the number of workers covered by collective bargaining went into steep decline. Fast forward to 2023, and long-term consequences of all of that are plain to see. Inequality is rampant in our workplaces. Insecure work is now the norm for large numbers of people, and living standards for the vast majority of workers are stagnant. Now, when I was growing up, not to sound like all high yesterdays, but when I was growing up, poverty was a function of unemployment. People were poor because they didn't have jobs. Today, of the 15 million people living in poverty, half of them are in work. 
Meanwhile, the, top, the wealth of the top 1% has grown 31 times faster than the wealth of the rest of us over the course of the last decade. No surprise then that in Britain, the financial wealth held by the richest 1% of households is greater than for the entire bottom 80% of the population. And over the past 40 years, the share of global output going to the wealthy has trebled. By all the available metrics, our current economic system is failing working people. The economist Han Jun Chang has warned that economics has become like Catholic theology in medieval Europe. It has become the language of the rulers. And it's clear that their interests are crushing the interests of the people that I represent. Even on its own terms, as I set out earlier, our economic model is a dismal failure. We've got next to no growth in the UK economy. Business investment is pitifully low. Productivity performance is dire. And I think the case for a fundal, fundamental reset for a new kind of economy is overwhelming. That will entail a future Labour government making some difficult but necessary choices about who and what it is for. As Ralph Miliband so presently wrote, all concepts of politics, of whatever kind, are about conflict. How to contain it, how to abolish it. Now, Labour is already committed to do many of the things that are necessary to reconfiguring our economy. A smart, active industrial strategy, investments in skills and vocational education, the New Deal for Workers that I talked about before. But it is going to go, need to go further to deliver the good jobs, the high wages, the long-term prospects that workers crave. And for inspiration, I think Labour could do worse than look across the Atlantic at the Inflation Reduction Act, a massive programme to transition to net zero, to reboot the US industry, to create millions of good and crucially unionised jobs. That will cost the US government as much as $800 billion, but in turn it will unleash $1.7 trillion in private sector sp spending. And the Biden administration has made it clear, explicit, that it wants to see that investment in green manufacturing happen inside the US, reviving industrial towns and cities, many of which have been in decline since the 1980s. Now, we can't simply transplant the American template and apply it here, but that Inflation Reduction Act offers a glimpse of how progressive governments can really harness the power of the state to create new jobs and opportunities, to facilitate a just transition to net zero, to change the terms of the economic debate, and to show once and for all that the old model is dead. And also to signal that an economy can and should be run in the interest of real people in real communities. Now, all of that won't happen by accident, and it certainly won't happen for free. It demands an honest debate about who pays for the investment we need in infrastructure, jobs, and services. And that speaks to the second priority I want to talk about, which is putting in place fair taxes, including more effective measures to tax wealth and excess profits. The US Supreme Court judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, famously said that taxes were the price we pay for living in a civilised society. But for far too many wealthy individuals, corporations, financial institutions, they become an optional extra. Something for the little people, uh, not for them. When Labour came to power in 1997, it inherited an economy on the rise. But we know, should it win the forthcoming election, it will have to deal with an economy that is scraping along the bottom. Public services that have been left crumbling by a decade or more of austerity and neglect. Public finances shot to pieces. And while Labour is absolutely right to say we need to get growth in the UK economy, it's wrong to assume that growth alone can get us out of this mess or that that growth will materialise without active investment. And that's why the TUC is calling for a national conversation about tax, about how those with the broader shoulders can start paying their fair share. Now, our job is to represent workers. It's not our job to design the uh, country's tax code. And I am genuine when I say I want a national conversation about tax rather than for Labour to sort of somehow cut and paste uh, the answers from the TUC's policy work in this area. But let me give you some idea of what we're talking about. We could start by taxing capital gains at the same rate as income, so that a hedge fund trader pays tax in the same way and at a similar rate to the person that clean, cleans their office. That would raise £12 billion a year in this country. We can ask the richest 140,000 people, those with wealth above £3 million, to pay just a little bit more. And based on what the Spanish government 
is doing through its solidarity tax, that would yield another £10 billion a year. And we could le levy a proper windfall tax, as Labour has set out on the excess profits of the energy giants, and that this year would raise another £2 billion. And we could do the same on the excess profits of the banks and on, 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 on online retailers like Amazon, a company that doesn't pay its fair share of taxes and doesn't respect the right of its workforce to be represented by independent trade unions. Because surprise, surprise, companies that don't play fair on tax don't play fair on workers' rights either. either. We could close glaring loopholes like those exploited by non-DOMs. We could beef up revenue and customs so we can clamp down on the tax cheats. And for years we've been told in this country and beyond that wealth taxes don't work, that the globally rich mobile, uh, mobile rich will just move assets elsewhere, that smart lawyers and wealth advisors will help them get round new taxes. But frankly, we've never tried, and it's time to call their bluff and time to meet a clear public demand for tax justice. Four in five British people back a strong, stronger windfall tax on energy profits. Three quarters think capital gains should be taxed at the same or a higher rate than income. And over six in ten think wealthy people should pay more tax, including over half of Tory voters in the last election. Now, there's a bit of a fly in the ointment about all of this, which is that to date, despite their obvious popularity and despite promising action on non-DOMs and other progressive tax measures, Labour has ruled out new wealth taxes, no doubt mindful of the need to win the support of UK PLC and the city. I, I sort of get that, but I'm going to continue to bang the drum because the proposals I've set out are not revolutionary by any stretch of the imagination. Big corporates will still enjoy bumper profits. The City of London will remain a preeminent financial centre. Rich people will still be rich. They'll just be paying a little bit more tax. Cast your minds back, for those who were around at the time, to the aftermath of the financial crash. The then Labour government introduced a new 50 pence tax rate on top earners. Its detractors warned then that it would result in a mass exodus of entrepreneurs, innovators and investors, investors just as they warned in 1997 that a national minimum wage will put a million people on the dole and crash the UK economy. Nothing of the kind happened in either case. So it is time for a recalibration for those who have proper, profited and prospered for decades to pay a little bit more, for action to tackle what J.K. Galbraith called private affluence and public squalor. And here's the rub of my final point, Robin, on tax. That's my view, but it's the view of some of the richest people in the world as well. Last year, a group of more than 100 of the world's wealthiest people called themselves patriotic millionaires, urged governments to make them pay more tax because they argue that that is the bedrock of a strong democracy. And again, let me quote, as millionaires, we know that the current tax system is not fair. Few, if any of us, can honestly say that we pay, pay our fair share in taxes. This injustice, baked into the foundation of the international tax system, has created a colossal lack of trust between the people of the world and the elites who are the architects of this system. Bridging that divide is going to take more than billionaire vanity projects or piecemeal philanthropic gestures. It's going to take a complete overhaul of a system that up until now has deliberately been designed to make the rich richer. To put it simply, restoring, tax, uh, restoring trust requires taxing the rich. The world, every country in it, must demand the rich pay their fair share of tax. Tax us, the rich, and tax us now. Well, I couldn't have written it better myself. Um, but honestly, and you will debate this, no doubt, at the LSC all the time, for decades, the global elite have pretty much called all the shots on tax and other aspects of public policy. It's their voices that have been the loudest. It's their interests that all too often have shaped our politics. And I believe firmly it is time the pendulum swung the other way. And that takes me on to my third and final priority for the future, and that is a strong worker voice to shape the transitions that lie ahead. Now, I talked earlier about some of the big challenges that are staring us in the face, whether it's net zero, new technology, artificial intelligence, all are already having an impact on workers and their communities. All have the potential to either create or destroy jobs, and all demand strong active leadership from government. And that doesn't mean 
a top-down response from those in the corridors of power. It means engaging with everybody affected by the transformations that are underway. Not just businesses and shareholders and investors, but communities, workers and their unions. Get the approach right and we can minimise the pain of the change ahead, create good skilled jobs in the regions that need them most and avoid the painful deindustrialization of the 1980s, the scars of which are still being felt today. Now, I grew up in Merseyside in the 1980s and 1990s. I saw what happened when government left industrial transition to the market. Mass unemployment, communities ruined for decades, not years. Life chances and indeed life expectancy itself cut short. And now we're in a situation where the IMF, the OECD, the World Economic Forum and publications like the FT and The Economist are all advocating for a stronger voice for workers. And I want Labour to lead the way. So important plans uh, set out by the party already around a proper industrial strategy, a new economic growth council, a social partnership bringing together both sides of industry and government, a focus on how we build a stronger, greener, more balanced economy. But we're going to need Labour in government to do more. And I want the experience and the ideas and the exp uh, expertise of the people we represent, of working people, to lead the debate about things like net zero and artificial intelligence. It's our members who are on the front line and understand the changes that are happening in workplaces. According to the Bank of England, 15 million jobs are vulnerable to automation. The Green Jobs Task Force estimates 6 million jobs need upskilling or reskilling for net zero. And TUC research shows there are 800,000 jobs right now at risk in our industrial heartlands because of the government's reckless climate politicking. So the stakes are, could not be higher and nothing should be off the table. I believe passionately we should see workers on boards, as is common across Europe, so we can shape decisions at a firm level. New collective agreements between employers and workers on technological change and net zero and consultation and engagement with workers at the sharp end of change, so that change is done with people, not to them. Whether that's a postal worker managing the switch to an electric fleet at Royal Mail, or a car engineer at Ford fighting for their engine to make electric drive systems, or the workers at Cummins Diesel Engine Factory now making hydrogen power plants for real trucks. Those are all real workers and real examples of where unions and union reps can make the difference. And it's vital that we call on that collective knowledge to make the most of the economic opportunities on offer and to create the good jobs of the future. And last but not least, I want workers to have a say about the laws, regulations and policies we need to deliver change that is fair and just. We've just recently at the TUC launched our Artificial Intelligence Task Force, bringing together trade unions, employment lawyers, academics, politicians from across the political spectrum, technologists, to start to fill in the legislative gaps, to make sure new technology isn't abused in the workplace. We're aiming to publish a draft AI and employment bill early next year. We'll be lobbying to incorporate it into UK law. But it doesn't matter whether it's AI or net zero or how we deliver public services. My overarching message to a future Labour government is simple. Involve workers, listen to workers, respond to workers. I'm going to finish on, on these points, Robin, because I've talked a lot about what the trade union movement want from Labour and it's a pretty extensive list of asks. But I'm also a realist and I know that our own movement, the trade union movement, has to adapt to a changing world of work. In fact, we've always been at our best when we've not just adapted to the changing world of work, when we've actually helped shape that changing world of work as well. So whatever happens at the next election, we've got a job to do ourselves to better reach out to and to organise today's workers, to reach out to private sector workers who make up the vast majority of the workforce, to engage young workers who are most in need of a collective voice at work, to represent a growing army of gig economy workers. And I'm proud of the fact that we represent five, six million people in workplaces up and down the country, but that means that four in five workers in this country are not uh, in a union at all. Now, I think our destiny very much lies in our own hands. We are powerful agents of change in our own right. We are still Britain's largest democratic mass movement of and for uh, working people. We've shown we can grow, that we can make breakthroughs in new parts of the economy. We've signed recognition agreements with Uber, with Deliveroo, with Parcels Courier Every. We've broken through in anti-union strongholds like Ryanair. 
And for four out of the past six years, we've recorded net increases in our membership. Modest net increases in our membership, but increases nonetheless. But we've got to do more to reach out and bring in a new layer of activists, particularly activists from black and ethnic minority communities, to expand our campaign to win union recognition for all outsourced facilities workers. So it doesn't matter what contract you work on or who you work for, there's a union there representing you in the workplace. And to support unions to develop new joint union organising campaigns. I'm absolutely clear I'll measure my success or otherwise as TUC General Secretary based on whether or not we build our movement, rebuild our collective strength and build a trade union movement actually that reflects the diversity of modern Britain, a more inclusive, more representative trade union movement. If we can do that, if we can do that under a worker friendly Labour government, then we can shape a better, brighter future for millions of working people. And for all of the challenges that I've talked about and that I've outlined this evening, I am an optimist. This is a moment for the left, for modern forward looking for trade, trade unions, for a confident Labour Party. Free market fundamentalism has failed and instead we need a very different approach. Interventionist, because the challenges facing us are too big to be left to the market. Collectivist, because change must be done with, for and by working people. And radical, because this is not a time for caution, but through action. And throughout our history, the labour movement has always been best when we've been at our boldest. That's what helped us uh, in our contribution when we defeated fascism in the 1940s. It's how we built the modern welfare state, the NHS, homes for those returning from war, how we forged a new way forward for Britain in the white heat of new technology in the 1960s and how we rebuilt our schools, hospitals and services in the new millennium. And our task now, I think, is equally large to fix that broken Britain and deliver that new deal. Me and Ralph Miliband, uh, as well as sharing a, a Polish heritage, have one other thing uh, in common is that we both only addressed the Labour Party conference once in our lives. I spoke at the Labour Party conference in 1994 in Blackpool. Ralph Miliband, for all this history, on the left, only addressed the Labour Party once, and that was in Margate in 1955, another glamorous seaside location. And on that occasion, he called on the conference to reaffirm, and I quote, we are a socialist party engaged on a great adventure, and we have a vision which the Tories never have had and never will have, that we are concerned with building that kind of socialist commonwealth which our forebears wanted and which millions of our people in our movement have tried to build. I'm proud to share Ralph Miliband's vision, proud to be part of that tradition of that movement, and I know that working together, both wings of our movement, the Labour Party and the trade union movement, can deliver the hope that working people so desperately need and deserve. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so very much um, for these excellent stimulating comments. As I said at the beginning, um, I get to ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to hand over to, to everyone else. Um, I just want to pick up the third of the three points that you, you made, your sort of action points, if you like, which was about strong worker voice. Um, I'm actually very much in favour of that and it's something I've, I've written about. In Britain, in, in any case, it's not always been the case that the trade union movement has favoured uh, strong worker voice, at least strong worker voice that's not organisationally linked to the unions themselves. And yet in Sweden, Germany and other places, that fear, I think, of that type of voice proved ill-founded. In fact, they became a platform for trade unions. What's the state of that debate in contemporary Britain? I mean, is, is the position you're articulating now a consensus about it? Is there still some tension about the capacity for unions to feel threatened by these types of worker representation I, I think there's absolutely consensus that we need stronger worker voice. I think there would still be concerns about the, the danger of unions being incorporated, if you like. Uh, I think you have to be very clear that, for example, workers on boards are not there to, as a substitute for collective bargaining, they're not there to negotiate at a board level on behalf of workers, they're there to provide strategic insight into the governance of a, of a firm uh, or, or an organisation and I think you know, unions would want to guard against that but we, we you know, for example, for, for decades we've had union trustees on pension fund uh, uh, 
boards. And we want a very clear, I think, consensus that we want more worker voice rather than less. And it's interesting, I think companies themselves also adapt to different models, and you'll know this better than, than me, Robin, but the example I always give is that, you know, if you go to BMW in Germany, they'll have a, a supervisory board with work representatives on the supervisory board. They'll have a works council. They'll have collective bargaining uh, with EG Metal at a workplace level, but also a sectoral level. You come to the UK, BMW, Mini in, in, in Oxford, will collectively bargain with Unite, but none of that, none of the rest of it will be there. Um, and then you go to BMW in Spartanburg, North Carolina, and they don't recognize unions at all. You can't get into the plant. And it's amazing how companies adapt themselves to the, the legislative framework in which they, they adopt. So I've got no doubt at all that if we had, for example, workers on boards, it would be a challenge for unions in the TUC to make sure we had the right people, that they were properly supported, that they understood what their role was. But I absolutely think it would shine a light into Britain's boardrooms. It would help, obviously, bring a little bit more transparency to the decisions that are, are taken there. I think it would help make our boardrooms a little bit more diverse. And crucially, the most important thing for me, it would encourage more long-term thinking in Britain's boardrooms, I think, because ultimately the people that we represent are people who've got an interest in the long-term future of the organisation that employs them. And I see that, you know, in workplaces up and down the country when I go and talk to union members. They're not interested in, does the share price do well next year or the year after? They're interested in the company being successful for the next 5, 10, 15 years and more. Mm. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, since we're in a university setting, I just want to ask a second question that bears on the relationship of or students, I guess, or, or maybe the educated and the members of the British trade union movement. Now, if we go back to the time of the Fabians who were founding the LSE and also attending the trade union congress that convened to establish the Labor Party, there was a clear alliance between elements of this sort of educated group, if you like, and ordinary working people. Today, there's a vigorous effort to drive a wedge between those two groups by some people in public life. Um, to sort of draw a wedge, if you like, between the cultural elite, who are so-called, and the left behind, so-called. What, what do you think the role of the trade union movement is in that context? Is there something to be done to address it? And, and what is the role of students and the, the educated in that context? Uh, I mean, th that's a big question. I think, first of all, you have to, you have to look at actually who makes up our membership. And actually, our, our, our membership, uh, the biggest chunk, biggest single chunk of membership will be uh, university educated uh, uh, professionals in the public sector. Um, and actually, w where we struggle often to organise is amongst lower paid workers, people in more insecure employment, in part of, you know, you know, whether it's someone working on a zero hours contract in a distribution centre or someone, wor someone working in retail. So in the public sector, our density is around about 50%. Portion of the workforce is around about 50%. Uh, in retail, it's more like 11 or, or 12%. And in sectors like hospitality, you know, people working in, in coffee bars or in hotels and restaurants, uh, I mean, union density is 6 7%. So, uh, you know, actually, our, our, our membership is much more diverse than people give us uh, sort of credit for. I mean, I, I hate this sort of like, I mean, this is what this government does. It likes to drive wedges between different groups of working uh, people. And this sort of thing that, you know, somehow it, only people in Primrose Hill who drink lattes and you know drive electric cars are interested in climate change and ordinary working people aren't. We've got lots of members who really do care desperately about climate change and some of them will be working in energy and energy intensive industries and some of them will be working in hospitals and schools but they still care about it because they care about the future uh, for the kids and so I think our job and I sort of alluded to this in some of my remarks before is to try and bring working people together. I, I mean I think that's going to be difficult uh, in the run-up to the next election because I think the government is run out of road and it will be playing these sort of culture wars not just between the cultural elite and ordinary hard-working people so-called you know but you know, it'll be on trans issues it'll be on migration it'll be on unions I mean I think that was part of the playbook and why uh, uh, they, they brought in that legislation I thought they I think they thought what they'd do is successfully drive a wedge between unions and ordinary working people Forget actually that our members, our members are ordinary working people and they are the British public and it's our members who not only drive trains and buses and provide public services but use those services day in, day out. Frankly in a way that many people sat around the cabinet table don't. No, thank you very much. Um, 
Well, I don't want to take up any more of the time because I'm sure there's lots of other people with questions. I just want to indicate to the audience in front that we also have an online audience. Um, so from time to time I have to, I'll try to take some questions from the online audience. Um, but can I first just get an indication of um, who would like to ask a question um, to our speaker here? So, can we start up? Um, when I call you, can you just say who you are and where you're from so that the online audience can hear what's going on? Uh, hello. <coughs> I thank you, Paul. That was a, a great speech. Um, I liked a lot of your points that you made about the challenges for the future. Um, sorry, my name's, my name's Cameron. I'm a political sociology uh, master's student. Um, I just wondered, because it seemed like you expressed quite a lot of support for a Labour government in the future, and also quite a lot of optimis optimism that that will happen, which I, I would agree that's inevitable, given how catastrophically bad the Tories have been on a lot of policies at the moment. But I just wondered whether you think that a Keir Starmer Labour government will be sufficiently radical to address a lot of the problems that you've been speaking about. Um, for example, well, uh, and, uh, and on the side of that, whether Keir Starmer can be trusted to actually follow through on a lot of the policy promises that he has made, given how he has reneged on a lot of, for example, green uh, climate policies or migration policies, um, you know, no, no new oil and gas fields, and essentially conforming to Tory rhetoric on migration. Um, yeah, do you think that his Labour government can be trusted to fulfil the promises it makes and the sort of changes that you're looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so, radical enough, trustworthy enough. Well, I, I think there was, a, there was an early part of the question in terms of will Latti Labour form a government? And just to say, I, I, I mean, I, and I made this point before, I think it takes a 97-style swing where Blair got, what, a 170-odd seat majority? A 97-style swing to get a one-seat majority for Labour at, at the moment. Um, so I don't think that a majority Labour government is nailed on by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's probably the most likely outcome at the moment, but I don't think it's nailed on by any stretch uh, of the imagination. Uh, th that will be the choice at the next election. Uh, and it was the quote I opened with fr fr from Ralph Miliband. It's not going to be a choice between Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer and somebody else. The choice at the next election and the, sh the shape of British politics is that will be the choice at the next election. So from, from my mind, a Labour government and winning a Labour government at the next election uh, is really important. I have to be honest with you, Cameron, I sat in our meetings of some of our leadership groups uh, back in um, 2010, and there were some people who said, well, it makes no difference who wins the next election because they're all as bad as each other. I think the last 13 years have proved that, you know, tested that, that theory to destruction because this government has been a disaster for the working people that we represent. It, it, is, is Labour going to be radical enough in, in e every respect that I want to be? Absolutely not. I've been a member of the Labour Party for the last 30 years. I've been disappointed by Labour leaders <laughs> of all persuasions, I have to say, in that 30 years. But I do think, I mean, that New Deal for Workers that I set out before, I think it is an extremely radical set of proposals. Uh, it's certainly more radical than the 97, anything the 97 Labour government introduced, and whether it's I, it would make a real difference to, to work and people. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I was in Coventry a couple of months ago on the picket line with those Amazon workers where the GMB have organised over a 1,000 members into membership in Amazon. Amazon's response was to spend a million pounds a week employing more staff, so they di effectively diluted the, uh, the bargaining unit. They would say that that had nothing to do with the union's organising campaign. I think our union's got a very different... Uh, the GMB's got a very different take on it. But running that organising campaign, we could, we've got no legal right to even access the workplace. You're trying to organise in a sector with insecure employment, with a hostile management, and you have to do it sat on the roundabout outside the workplace. So unions having the right to even get into the workplace to talk to workers, I think, would make a massive difference when you put it alongside other new rights like a ban on zero hours contracts, like day one employment rights. It starts to look like a very radical package, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, that is something where, you know, all I can tell you is that our Congress this year, Angela Lorena made a commitment to deliver that new deal within the first 100 days of a Labour government. She reiterated that at the party conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, as did Keir, as did Rachel Reeves, as did Johnny Reynolds in the business department. So I hope and expect that Labour will deliver that. 
that doesn't mean that we're going to agree on everything, and it doesn't mean that we don't continue to push Labour on things. And I, I say, I remember vividly in the previous Labour government spending a lot of time arguing with Labour politicians about things like the private finance initiative, and unions arguing that this was an absolutely bonkers way to fund uh, capital investment in our in our public services, that it would cut, it would be a millstone around our neck, that it would be uh, that it would be. Uh, inefficient, expensive, and I think unfortunately we were proved to be right. So there will always be a contested relationship on behalf of Labour and unions because we are directly representing our members and putting forward the stuff that really matters to them. But I have to say, I, I've got, you know, uh, for, for my mind, the, the thing that gives our members a fighting chance at the next election is a Labour government, and a Labour government that goes forward on a manifesto into that election, you know, talk about some of the things that I've talked about, that new deal for workers, insourcing, railways back in public ownership. Um, it won't be a land of milk and honey, but it'll be a hell of a lot better than where we are right now. Great. Let's see. Um, so we've got quite a few questions here. Um, can we start with this person with the glasses? Just wait till the microphone comes and then don't forget to say who you are and where you're from. Thank you, Paul. Um, my name is Stephanie Doblos, a student here at, at the LSE. I'm wondering, how has the two TUC responded to um, uh, the government's attacking our right to strike? And do you feel that workers have started to really mobilise, slash start joining unions more since this? Uh, in answer to the second part of the question, the jury is really still out. I mean, we saw a modest increase in our membership uh, this year. The official statistics, which are based on... Uh, survey work done in November of last year showed that our membership went down by £200,000 and I suspect that there are conflicting things happening. I think where unions are taking action in workplaces it probably led to an up upsurge in membership but we've also got a, a group of members that have been really clobbered by that cost of living crisis and I think lots of people going through their direct debits at the end of every month and thinking can I afford to you know 15, 20 pounds is a big it's a big financial commitment and I think that that will be having an impact. In, in terms of uh, um, our campaign against the attack on the right to strike. I mean, I think it's taken different forms. They've got it onto the statute book now. Um, and they got it onto the statute book, they, and they always were going to because they had the parliamentary maths to do that. And, you know, sort of, I think this is, you know, uh, as I said before, I think this is one of the... They, they will go into the next election trying to use that Strikes Act and potentially using the Strikes Act to drive a wedge between unions and working people and, and frankly between unions and Labour as well because Labour have committed to repeal um, the legislation. What, what have we done? We did all the things that you would expect in terms of you know, a campaign including working very closely with the House of Lords to try and dilute and you know, sort of delay the bill uh, as much as possible. Uh, uh, public campaign and we had a national rally outside Parliament, you know, the mass petition, the quarter of a million signed, uh, people signed a petition. I think the real test is going to come in, in, in the weeks and months ahead. We're still waiting for the final regulations, but I'm pre, you know, I think I can say with confidence the first worker who was sacked as a result of that legislation or the first union that is sanctioned, I think there will be a whole trade union movement response to that. Um, I think there will be lots of employers who will be very, very wary about using that legislation because they know it's going to be poisonous legislation. I mean, imagine being the hospital trust that sacks a paramedic or a nurse for exercising their fundamental right to strike, or indeed a teacher or a railway worker. I think employers will uh, be cautious about that. We've made a formal complaint to the ILO, uh, and we'll wait to get the regulations and for it to be tested, to, to test it in the courts. And in fact, we did it with the, the government's previous attack on the right to strike, the, the uh, um, change of the regulation to allow uh, employers to use agency workers to undermine strike action, something that even Margaret Thatcher didn't do. We challenged them in the High Court on that, and they lost. Um, and the High Court found that their decision to in introduce the law was irrational and unlawful. I suspect if we test this again, legally it will be the case. To be honest with you, the real, the, real, the real way to get rid of that piece of legislation is to get a new government, and a Labour government that's committed to repealing the legislation. So, I, I mean, what I, what I can't do is, is say, because genuinely I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think, if I called a demonstration next week, against the Tories' anti-strike legislation. I think we get 10, 15, 20,000 people. I don't think we get 5 million people or a million people or 100,000 people. I think people are, are still, even our own members, are still a little bit too removed from, well, what does it actually mean? It's, it, it, it's you know, I'm not sure how it would impact on me and my workplace. 
as I say, I think that the real impact is that it will take away the right to strike from one in five workers. And I said the real test will be if they try and use that legislation, I think. Right. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh, we've got so many people here. So I'm just going to start with you on the front there. And then I'll Hello, I'm Angela from Italy. Sorry, I'm not from UK, but we can learn a lot from you. So, <laughs> um, so we agree that there is a lot of inequality that has grown in the recent years all over Europe, US, obviously. And the role of technology is very important. And I wanted to ask you two questions about technology. One is related to AI. How do you make sure that you have the right expertise and capabilities to deal with AI and to understand the implications of AI and to make sure that AI benefits everyone? So you talked about this task force. Yeah. What if these technologies come from open AI, come from meta, and they start telling you, you know, you have to make AI, you have to increase competition, you cannot make an industrial strategy because uh, you will hinder competition, you will reduce innovation in UK. So you, I think you need expertise, and I wanted to understand if you are starting recruiting uh, people that actually know about AI. Uh, and the other question is the role of digital technologies, social networks, and technology generally in labor. So how you organize labor, how you, how you organize action, you said that low-paid workers, you struggle to find them, you struggle to talk to them. So I was thinking, how do you deal with that and how do you use digital technologies and social networks in trying to organize and communicate to these people? Also before, you were uh, t telling about how um, it's difficult to, to raise awareness among people on what is actually a strike, what, what are your rights, I was thinking that maybe through social networks and you know digital technologies, you could actually have a, a real impact on also low-paid workers because they are all on social networks. So that was yeah. my question. Thank you. All right, that, that's like a massive question, that Angelo, a massive set of questions. I, I mean, our, our approach to AI, first of all, I think it's got to be rooted in in our values. So you know, sort of. This is, I think that's the safeguard about, uh, against the injury influenced by the, by, by the tech giants in terms of, you know, this is not the first wave of technological change that unions have had to manage and adapt and shape. I mean, there's been previous waves of technology. You could argue that this is in some way more transformative, but I think that there are principles that stand us in good stead. So that sort of sense of, we need to bargain, bargain how those, those technological changes happen in workplaces and try to bargain not just at the level of the workplace but to introduce regulation and legislation that gives us the, the levers that we need uh, to influence uh, that. We are taking on, I mean, so there's a, 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 a by, by all means, uh, check her out on social media and, and in terms of the, the work that she's taking forward, we've got a woman called Mary Towers who's, who's our AI expert and I think Mary is as plugged into anybody and understands the impact of AI in workplaces as well as anybody on the other side of, of the table. Um, and we're also talking, crucially, to other unions around the world as well, because we're not doing this in isolation. So I was over in Spain uh, about 12 months ago to talk to, to, to Spanish unions about the legislation that they've introduced through their governments about how, how they regulate the use of algorithms in workplaces. There's a big challenge to say, yes, you've got to have access to the algorithm and be able to influence it. And then having the skills and the capability to do that, that's a big question. But we are talking actively to other, to other union centres. And so that, that AI manifesto that we're developing it covers everything from making sure that you know, decisions that are taken about recruitment, about managing performance, ultimately there's a human arbiter so that you can't be sacked by algorithm. You can't just recruit people through algorithms as well. We know that those algorithms uh, reflect innate biases uh, anyway and can just reinforce. Uh, discrimination. I think the crucial thing for us is just thinking about who actually benefits from the digital dividend that's going to come down the line. And there will be a huge digital dividend. For us, that's an opportunity to talk about things like working hours, about the age that people retire, about more flexibility at work, about higher pay. That could happen. And if we don't get it right and we don't manage to, then it could just mean that, you know, Jeff Bezos can send more rockets off to space. You know, good for him, but not very good for the people that, that we represent. So, 
I say, I mean, it's, it's big and it's scary and it's stuff that I'm not an expert on, but I'm confident that we've got people who are experts uh, who can help um, influence that. And, and maybe just, just on that, because this is a, a really important point. For the TUC, influencing these debates, it's not just because we've got a couple of really good, clever people working for us at Congress House. We've got reps in workplaces up and down the country who understand this technology, who are working with their employers constantly uh, to think about how technology is deployed, what impact it has on the workforce and how we manage it. So to give you an example, I was at uh, an insurance company probably about 18 months ago. We're obviously, I mean, they're deploying AI now for lots of the routine stuff that would have been in the, back, in the past dealt with by someone at the end of the phone or someone at the end of a chat function online. AI picking up a lot of that now, but they've, they've brought in job security agreements where the, you know, we're making sure that people are redeployed reskilled, doing other work, not that sort of, and that in some ways they were doing things like complex fraud investigations, which was more interesting than the, the work they were previously doing. So our members get this sort of stuff and, you know, have got that relationship with their, their employers. And I think that is the difference. We're not a think tank or a lobby group. We've actually got people in workplaces talking to employers about this stuff all the time. In terms of unions taking advantage of these new technologies, we've actually got a thing at the TUC called Digital Lab, which is piloting different approaches with unions about how we deploy different types of of technology, some of it really boring stuff about membership databases, others much more interesting about how you use um, digital new technologies to reach out and campaign. I mean, for, for my mind, I always, because I've got three kids who are in their, their mid-20s, two, two of them don't work in unionised environments, and I know our stuff is having cut through. If my daughter gets it on her TikTok, it won't surprise you to, to, to learn I am not on TikTok, and I am not going to go on TikTok. But I know when she gets something on TikTok, it's not because she signed up to a TUC website somewhere or because she's you know, active in a union. It's because we're managing to reach out to the people that we need to reach out to, to those young workers who aren't members of unions with our, with our content and people are sharing it. And it's, it does mean you know, stuff that's deliberately non-corporate TUC, which might be a little bit edgier. Um, so I, I think, again, we've got, you know, for, for us, there's a real potential there to use that technology to reach out to, to workers. I mean, you know, in the past, trade union education was always done in classrooms, face to face, with small groups of workers, 15 or 16. We had to get them time off from work. We had to pay for them to come and go on residential training courses. We can reach out to tens of thousands of people now and do through our webinars and online courses that people can do when they want it, access when they want it. Now, I think there's always going to be uh, the value in having a sort of blended approach, but it allows us to scale up our education work and to bring in people into new routes to activism that frankly never existed 10, 15, 20 years ago. And we'd be, as a movement that is built on people, we madically weren't using those technologies to try and rebuild our own uh, movement. So I, you know, I'm quite um, uh, excited about the prospect of how we use that technology in a way that allows us to scale up our organising efforts. You know, I mean, Little things, uh, and, it, and it is little things, but it's things that make a tangible difference. That um, King's Mill strike that I talked about before, the union, um, you know, the, the members there were on £11.65 an hour, and that £11.65 an hour included payments for shift working, so evenings and nights, payments for bank holidays, all payments for working at the weekend, all rolled into £11.65 an hour. This is not a group of workers who can afford to go on a strike, and using the thing called Strike Funder, we managed to raise for them. It wasn't a huge amount of money. It was £7,000. But it allowed people to go out on strike. It allowed people to go out on strike and to get some money for going out on strike. And actually, that's the difference. That little bit of technology helped us win a strike that a group of workers otherwise, frankly, couldn't have afforded to have spent you know, time out on the picket line. So it's little things like that, I think, that make a massive difference that allow us to, to leave the support from the wider public for our members. Thanks. Now, all this talk of technology draws my attention to the fact that I'm supposed to get some online questions through to this piece of technology on the table, but they're not coming through. However, I know there are online questions, so I'm going to deal with the matter by asking my colleague um, who helps organise these sessions to read out one of them. So if you uh, could take to Chris the microphone. Hi there, thanks. Um, so there's a lot of online questions, so I'm going to try to group them into themes, um, and one of them is about, one theme is about labor internationalism. And it's essentially, uh, do you think international norms and organizations such as the ILO are fit for purpose in the current working environment? Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, that's a big question. I, 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 I mean, it's important for us. 
Uh, I think we get frustrated. I mean, we've been in a long running um, argument, debate with the employer side at the ILO about the right to strike, or whether the ILO, um, the ILO should be sub upholding the fundamental right for workers to take strike action. But for us, it plays an important role. So I mentioned before, we put in a complaint to the ILO, the Committee of Experts, on the government's minimum services level legislation. In fact, the ILO had already asked the government to clarify um, some technical aspects around the legislation as part of a, a, a of earlier campaign that we've done. And I think it's important to, to hold the government to account. Do I think that you know the ILO has the teeth to force the UK government to do something? No. Um, do I think it's likely to in the short term? No. But for us, it's a, it's a useful mechanism. It's one mechanism that we've got to help hold the government to, to account. I think there's a broader set of issues about our international structures, the ITUC, the European TUC, groups like TUAC, which is the Trade Union Advisory Group to the OECD. I think if you look at all of those different institutions, they've been incredibly helpful to the British trade union movement in providing practical solidarity. And you know, quite often I think in the, in the British trade union movement, we have a quite a condescending view sometimes of solidarity, that it's about us providing solidarity to others and writing a letter of solidarity. I mean, if I think about that attack that we've had on the right to strike, uh, we've had the European TUC um, working very close, closely with the European Union, the European Commission, signaling the fact that that legislation potentially cuts across the level playing field agreement that's part of the trade and um, uh, cooperation agreement that we've got with Europe. Uh, and that's being raised directly by the European Union with the UK uh, uh, government. We've had the ITUC mobilising support from countries as diverse. I mean, you know, the Colombian trade unions writing to the UK government to express their concerns about the UK government's attack on the right to strike. So I, I think those inter international institutions are really important. TUAC, I think, has been important in making sure that, for example, groups like the OECD do talk about the value of collective bargaining and of trade unions, which, again, quite often puts them at odds with the UK uh, government. So we're always trying to think about how we use those international institutions as effectively as possible. But, I mean, the ILO, I think, actually is, is a really underpinning uh, important sort of cornerstone of fundamental labour rights right across the globe. Doesn't you know? Is it always as quick and as effective as we would want it to be? No, but it's a really important institution. Okay, I'm going to come back to the audience. Um, you know, there's there's a, a lot of people who want to ask questions. I also just want to draw attention to the fact that um, I know there are always some people who are high school students in the audience. So do please not hesitate to ask a question if that's you. But in the meantime, can we have this person with glasses in the front? Hello, I find it really frightening. Sorry, just that say no who wages. you are for the oh, online. My name's yeah. Anne, and I'm a garden designer. Um, I find it really frightening that low wages and high prices means that people can't afford to pay their union rates. I know it sounds crazy, but are there any plans in place to make employers pay union subscriptions for workers? And um, do you ever represent non-union members? Oh, um, I, I mean, legally it is very difficult and for us to, to get employers to, to pay union subscriptions. And actually there's real dangers with that as well. So, I mean, if I just think back to a, a sector like construction. In the past, uh, there have been examples where employers are quite happy to pay the union rates for, the, for, their, for their members, but it was like on the basis of, um, uh, well, we're paying the money, uh, there's no need for you to come on our side. And I actually think our real strength and power derives from the fact that we are built from the bottom up by ordinary working people. They pay us their money every single month. We're accountable to them. We're not accountable to the, their employer who pays their subscriptions for them. There have been a, a, attempts, and I think really interesting efforts in, in some sectors like finance in the past where, for example, new starters were encouraged by employers to join the union um, and, and effectively the union provided membership for free for the initial period of employment. And then once they got past their induction period, the employer raised their wages partly to offset the increase in, in union subscriptions. And I think that was an, uh, there's been some really interesting approaches there. And I actually think that for lots of employers, there is a value in having a genuinely representative, strong union in the workplace rather than a union where half of the workforce is in a union and the other half aren't. Or, so, so, but as I say, you're always trying to guard against that sort of I mean, ultimately, we derive our power from, from working people, and you know, I wouldn't want to do anything to cut across uh, that. The second part of the oh, non-members. Um, this has been, this is again, this has been contested territory in unions because I never like referring to union membership as an insurance scheme because it's not an insurance scheme. We're not, 
we're not the or and we're not like the AA, the fourth emergency service. Just pay us your money, and when you've got a problem, we can sort it out. Because actually, that's not really the way unions work. We work because we've got reps in workplaces, and we've got you know agreements in place with employers, um, and we can't guarantee that people are going to be protected. But we what what we want to do is build that workplace organisation to support them. So, so the principle has always been that you can't join a union after you've had a problem. I mean, quite often we do get lots of people ring up and say, um, I've got a problem at work, can I join? And I said, well, really you needed to join before. Where we've seen unions take a different approach, though, is where unions have decided that it's an important strategic organising campaign. So in some of those, those big, high-profile employers where we are trying to build membership and profile, Twitter would be a good example. Um, when, when Elon Musk uh, took over Twitter and arbitrarily sacked thousands of people, we had lots of people wanting to be join a union and be represented by a union. And in those cases, uh, at least one of our unions said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to take those people into membership because this is such a strategically important company that we're going to use this to build membership into the future and organisation. And I think that's probably the, the, right, the right call. But it's, there's always a balance there because what you can't have is a situation where... And we see it a lot because... It's not like the situation in the US where they have what they call fair shares agreements in quite a lot of states where even if you're not, you're not a union member, you have to pay an administration fee to the union for negotiating your contract. We don't have that arrangement in the UK. So if you're in a, a workplace where a UK negotiates a pay rise, you get the pay rise whether you're a member or not. And legally, we can't, and an employer can't discriminate against people who aren't union members, can't discriminate against those who are in union membership, can't discriminate against people for not being in, in, in membership. So it's, it's difficult, but I, I think finding ways of accepting for lots of young workers, for example, it's not that they've taken a conscious decision not to join a union, it's just because the union isn't present in their workplace. And so we've got to find a way of making union membership much more accessible. It goes back to the point before about technology. Um, you know. Well, exactly. You know, I, I joined the union, and Rob mentioned it before, because you know, when I went to work at ASDA, uh, my mum and dad were always union members, and you know, when you go to work, you join a union. There are lots of kids going into work. That won't be their experience. That won't be their parents' experience. working in very insecure employments and high turnover employment. Great. Um, let's see. Um, so I think we'll just take one more question here and then I'll go and ask for an online question. Just just wait for the mic and then who you are and where you're from. Hi, my name's Abin and I'm a gap year student. Um, you mentioned that there were 15 million jobs at risk of automation. And I was just wondering how this can or should be combated and also what measures you want to be, you want to see put in place to soften the blow down to the workforce as a result? Yeah, well, what we can't do is stop technology. I mean, we, we can't just say, you know, um, not that, you know, the Luddites are not, not quite often as they portray, but, you know, we, we, we can't pretend artificial intelligence isn't happening, or we can't pretend that in car plants, or, uh, you know, I was up in Airbus in Broughton um, in North Wales uh, a few months ago, that, you know, new technology is constantly being um, deployed in the workplace. I, I mean, the, 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 the example that always comes home to me is I remember taking a group of Japanese trade unionists a few years ago around uh, Jaguar Land Rover in Halewood. And the two deputy conveners, two senior union stewards who were in that plant, had both worked there for more than 40 years each. So these were people who were hardened trade unionists who'd been through every iteration in Jaguar Land Rover. And we were walking past one process and they said, well, that won't be there. That guy, uh, he won't be working on that machine next week because we're getting a robot in and the robot will do that job. And we're like, well, do you have to negotiate that with, with the company? What happens to, to that work? Do they get displaced? Will they lose the job? And they said, well, no, we've got, we've got an overarching agreement, which is, means that as new technology is deployed in the plant, that people are redeployed, reskilled, no loss of, no loss of income, no threat to job security. We want more robots in this plant, not less, because more robots make the plants more productive, more likely to make sure that our members' jobs in the long term are more likely, actually, that we can bargain more effectively on pay. So, you know, the instinctive reaction would be like, no, not another robot, because it stops, you know, a job our members doing. But I think they, they, they were 
Now, they've been around the block enough times to know that the job actually was to make sure that the, the impact that new technology was managed and that members saw the benefit from it. Uh, and, you know, in terms of comparisons to local jobs in the area, incredibly well paid, secure employment, uh, directly as a result of our unions reaching those sort of agreements with Jaguar Land Rover and with other employers. So, for me, the key thing is that, that at different levels, as I said before, workers having voice and being able to exercise some agency over the way the technology is deployed in their workplaces. I do think it's going to mean in some sectors, I'll g give you another example more on the sort of net zero front than um, uh, new technology, but I think the things are, are interrelated. I mentioned the government's green jobs task force uh, just before. I don't normally give this government any credit whatsoever. Uh, I'll give them credit for a thing called the green jobs task force, which they set up I think about two and a half, three years ago when Kwasi Kartang was at the Department of Business he set up a, a task force with unions, employers, education providers, to talk about how we're going to make the transition to make sure, I can't remember how many millions of green jobs they said that we want to get to by 2030. And we come up with a set of recommendations that included, for example, in every company, every uh, large carbon intensive employer, the employer should develop a net zero plan in consultation with its workforce, setting out very clearly what's the impact on skills, on jobs, how you're going to manage the the change. We said that that should happen at a sectoral level as well. I, I mean, that's the sort of uh, machinery I think that we need to establish so that our members do have their voices heard in these big industrial transitions. The government did nothing with it, uh, but it was important, I think, that we had employers and unions and others saying, we've got to find a way of managing, because if you don't, people will just oppose it. I, I absolutely understand our members in oil and gas who, who are very sceptical when they're told about good green jobs coming down the line in 10 or 15 years' time, well, they might not be the jobs I do, and they might not be in the community in which I live, and frankly, I'm not going to take on trust that I'm going to be the beneficiary of that in 10 or 15 years' time. I want to see, I want to see what it looks like right now for me and my job, and I think that's our job to make sure that their, their voices are heard at the table. And it speaks to the importance of what used to be called active labour market policy across the whole yeah. country now. I think we've got time for two more rounds. I'm going to go to the online people again. If you could just say who the question was from, um, Chris. Yeah, sure. So this one's from Alan Kerr, who says, Hi, Paul. Good to see you again. Why do you persist in advocating a wealth tax when Professor Richard Murphy eloquently argues that the rich will use their lawyers to make the tax impractical? Is it not better to close all the tax loopholes, which Richard Murphy argues could raise $80 billion a year? Uh, that's from Alan Kerr, retired trade union official. Alan, who's he? Uh, Alan Kerr. Yeah, all right. Hi, Alan. Nice to see you again, albeit virtually. Um, I don't think it's wealth taxes or clamping down on the loopholes uh, and, and um, tax avoidance and tax evasion. I think it's both and more. Um, and I said it before, I, I think we often get told that wealth taxes will lead to people being able to game the system or will lead to a, a flight of really bright, entrepreneurial, innovative, wealthy people from the UK. That's not been the experience in Spain. I don't think that we've seen a massive uh, out, uh, outward movement of wealthy people in Spain because the government introduced a modest wealth tax and I don't think we'd see it here in the UK. But it does also speak to the fact that we, we need to do what we can to work through international bodies to make sure that this is an approach that is adopted internationally. And, I don't know if people saw the report in the, uh, the Guardian today, I think it was, about the new EU observatory on tax, which talked precisely about wealth taxes and what governments collectively would need to do to make sure that people couldn't game the system or just report their you know, income elsewhere or their wealth uh, 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 elsewhere. So, you know, for my mind, absolutely we need to bump up the resource for HMRC to clap down on tax avoidance. I think Labour's right about non-DOMs. I think Labour is right about... VAT on private school fees, but I think Labour needs to go further. As I say, we've just become, as a country, incredibly good at taxing wealth, uh, work and not wealth. And I don't want to see, frankly, our members, particularly in the midst of this cost of living crisis, paying more tax. But I do want to rebuild our public services and I do want to find the money that we're going to need to invest in green jobs and new technology. And it's going to have to come from somewhere. And frankly, I think, you know, the wealthy can afford to pay their fair share. So. Yeah, I, I'm always a little bit sceptical when, uh, when people say, you know, they'll find a way around it. Well, let's make sure they can't find a way around it. I mean, we managed to, when, when, you know, we managed to clamp down on people who cheat the welfare system. I wish we applied as much time and effort to clamping down on tax avoidance as we do on you know, clamping down on people who, 
and then fat the year, you know, making a couple of quid on the benefits. I'm not condoning that either, by the way. But, you know, that's not official TUC policy, but, you know, sense of perspective. <laughs> Okay, now look, I think we can just have one last round. I'm sure there's more than one person who want to ask questions. So I think if we're all concise and you can sort of pick out, I can. And I'm concise, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so can I just get an indication? You've been waiting for some time. Um, so can we start with um, sports and social in the middle there? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Angel. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm a former alumni, Missoula alumni. Uh, at the LSE, and uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts about uh, the role of the monetary authority or the central bank in promoting working uh, workers' interest. Um, the, it, uh, about the role of who, sorry? Uh, uh, the Bank of England. Bank of England, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, yeah, because uh, recently uh, they got a new mandate on promoting uh, competitiveness and growth of the financial sector, and just in my point of view, I feel like monetary policy or setting the interest rates affects people's uh, well-being through mortgages and higher rent, uh, much more than the fiscal uh, uh, policies. So I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the role of the central bank? Yeah. Uh, okay, in, good. No, yeah. I'll just yeah. pause that one. Thank you. Um, so concise, please. Uh, very interesting question, but could be, could be more concise. I'll just come over here um, to the person at the end with the purple jumper. Hi Paul, Ari, I'm a master's in political sociology student. Um, you recently said that um, the real enemies of the working class are people who um, fly in by private jet and not, um, who don't come in by small boats, right? And I think, um, I mean, many, many people would have appreciated you saying that, um, but anyone who sort of worked on the ground um, would know that anti-immigrant sentiment is a real thing always is, to different, to different degrees. Um, what's your sense of how much it exists and what forms it takes today? Thanks. Um, and uh, we haven't taken anybody over there, so if anybody wants to wave their hand now, it's the moment. So, uh, person at the back. Hello, I'm Anthony, uh, an interesting member of the public. And my question is about the reskilling and training for green jobs that you mentioned earlier. And more specifically, how could the TUC aid a future government in ensuring that the training and reskilling reaches the right people, the right communities, and importantly, is also delivered by skilled people, especially in an environment post Brexit, post pandemic, where there are worker shortages in many sectors? Okay, thanks. So we've got monetary policy, immigration, skills. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. 30 uh, seconds each. Okay, right. So, so the Bank of England, I mean, actually, our, our main concern with the Bank of England, and, and we've expressed this directly to, to Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England. Our, our executive committee has met him uh, a couple of times over the, the past uh, 12 months. Um, we were very concerned about the governor and the bank more generally making the link between wages and inflation and somehow suggesting that it was wages and the wages of public sector workers, uh, the wages of supermarket workers, people working in car plants that were somehow driving inflation. I, I mean, hard to see how that would be the case because you know, wages have not kept pace with inflation. Uh, I mean, I think last, last week or the week before was the first time uh, in two years that wages edged above inflation. So it clearly wasn't the pay of our, our members that were driving uh, inflation. And we were concerned that he was talking about wages and wasn't talking about prices and he wasn't talking about profits. Um, and I think actually the bank have, have tempered their public comment now. Uh, they don't talk about wage-led inflation anymore and I think that's quite right. Uh, we, we've also expressed and, and used those opportunities when we've met him directly and we've done a lot of press work as well, just about warning against the use of interest rates being the you know, very blunt tool to hold down inflation because, again, it's our members. I mean, you know, that, that, the impact on people's... Uh, uh, mortgages on credit card payments. I mean, you've got people who are reliant on credit cards to go and do the supermarket shop. Um, really, really problematic. I think there's probably a scope to, re to, to reshape the remit of the Bank of England to think about other factors as well. Impact on employment, for example, uh, of the decisions uh, it, it, it takes. Um, and I, I think it more broadly it just speaks for us to think about, you know, in, in the UK, we've often, th you know, the key economic 
indicator is GDP. And frankly, I don't care if GDP goes up if the living standards of our members goes down. I'm interested in what happens to wages and what happens to living standards. So I think that's a broader discussion. On anti-immigrant sentiment, I mean, I said before, that will be something the government plays hard uh, at the, in the run-up to the next election. And I think, you know, go back to that Brexit debate and before, there's always been an element of this. Our, our unions and our members aren't immune to some of those, those issues. And I think that part of the... The issue is because in the UK, we always talk about migration through the lens of illegal immigration or as a problem or as a burden. Um, and, and in a way, what we do is we, we entrench some of those issues. What, what do I mean by that? I mean, in the run-up to that Brexit debate, I, I talked to lots of union members who were worried about agency workers who were coming from the European Union and, and they're working and they're, they're on the minimum wage and that's three or four pound an hour less than, than what I earn. And I understand why they were concerned about it. It wasn't the fault of the migrant workers. It was entirely lawful for their employer to pay them the minimum wage and pay them three or four pounds an hour. And then people wonder why we worry about migration. I think we have to see migration through the, the lens, not just of you know, the home office, but through labour market policies. No, we should make sure that anyone who comes to work in this country, whether they're uh, they've come to work here from the European Union or beyond, or they were born here, gets the rate for the job, regardless of where they were born. The shortage occupation list at the moment, it's lawful for an employer to pay 80% of the prevailing wage to somebody who comes from abroad to work in, for example, a care home. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. We've got 150,000 vacancies in social care, and lawfully you can pay somebody who travels from another part of the world to come and live and work in the UK 80% of the market rate for the job because they're on the shortage occupation list. And then we wonder why there's resentment. So we've got a big job in our own ranks. And to be honest with you, I mean, one of the projects that we've done, for example, with one of our unions in a, in a, in a large manufacturing workplace is thinking about how our members engage with social media. Quite often they engage with far-right social media, but they don't know that they're engaging with far-right social media because it starts off on the, don't you think the NHS should be better funded on? Don't you think that, you know, employers should be able to get away with X, Y, and Z? And then the way the algorithms work, you soon end up with Britain First or some other far-right group. So there's a big job for us to do about our membership. But I genuinely believe, and this is you know, someone who's the grandson of migrants, I think most people in this country don't care whether you come from the Indian subcontinent or you come from Poland or you come from Latin America. What, they, what, what they're worried about is employers using uh, agency workers or being able to pay... To, to undermine their jobs and their employment. And I think, as I said before, our job has got to be about bringing working people together rather than allowing those um, divisions uh, to be amplified. On reskilling and retraining, I mean, we had a really good example, actually, from the previous Labour government that actually survived 10 years of the current uh, of the uh, Conservative government, which was a thing called the Union Learning Fund, set up in 2000. It was around about £20 million a year, which was used to support union-led projects in workplaces on learning and skills. And it was everything from basic literacy, numeracy, IT skills through to people retraining, uh, uh, professional level qualifications. The government scrapped that a couple of years ago and they scrapped it because Gavin Williamson, who was then our education secretary, was upset that the teaching unions you know, were being, uh, as he would say, obstructive around the time of, pan of the pandemic by you know, the arbitrary decisions that him and Boris Johnson took to get people back into schools. Uh, and he scrapped it completely. We had hundreds of employers contact the government to say that that was a mistake because it was actually supporting really good um, uh, work on learning skills. I think we could reinvent that. So what does that mean? Union learning reps in workplaces who can work with, 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 with uh, staff to think about what, what are your skills needs, what do you want, what support do you need? A right to retrain so that people have got that right throughout their work in life so that they can take time out from work and know that they can access reskilling, retraining opportunities without, I think, a necessary uh, lo loss of income. And we need, frankly, a proper careers advice and guidance system in this country because I don't know where people really go. If I was thinking about reskilling, you know, re retraining, where would you go for proper advice and guidance, never mind financial support to get on the, on, on the, on, on the training programme, you know, support working with your employer or whatever to, to allow you to take time off to do that. So. There's loads that we can do, and I think we've got a track record. Uh, and frankly, you know, all too often I hear from employers, I do lots of work with employers, and there are lots of good employers out there, but you know, they'll moan about the further education system, or they'll moan about schools. 
Employers in this country invest about half the EU average in vocational training uh, in the UK. So they've got to take some responsibility. And if they won't take responsibility, we need to make sure that they find some way you know, enhancing things like the apprenticeship levy so that they pay their fair share towards retraining as well because it's not just the responsibility of individuals or the state, it's the responsibility of employers as well. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've heard a fascinating talk today um, from Paul Novak. In a sense, I think you've sketched out a situation in which, although the environment we're in is incredibly grim, with sort of growing in-work poverty, with um, cost of living crisis affecting really huge numbers of people, we nevertheless find ourselves in a moment a bit like that which Ralph Miliband described shortly before the 1964 election. Yeah. And you sketched out a sort of program for action, really, that listed three key things, something about making work rather than wealth pay, about tax justice, and about work of voice. To me, it sounds like a clear and a compelling case for change, and one which, if it were pursued, offers the prospect for the renewal of the forward march of Labor. So thank you very much, Paul, for talking to us at this very important time. Oh, thank you, and thank you, everybody. <laughs>